This video is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Y'all know, I do not play around when it comes to my sleep. So when Helix Sleep said that their mattresses were premium mattresses, customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped to your door, plus free shipping in the US, I had to find out for myself. But before you even get the mattress, you have to fill out Helix's sleep quiz. A quiz which matches your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you, based on your sleep positions and your firmness preference. I filled out the quiz and I'm a back and side sleeper who likes a firm mattress. And so Helix matched me up with the Twilight Lux mattress. And let me tell y'all, these mattresses are for real. I've had it for a couple weeks now, and first of all, my back has never felt better. This mattress is strong, it's firm, and compared to my old one, it's just so much more comfortable and resistant. You can really feel the hybrid combination of foam and springs. A couple weeks ago, I got back from a trip where the sleeping conditions were not the greatest, so coming home to this mattress was a blessing. I can't state enough how comfy and how personalized these mattresses are. Really, I used to toss and turn for hours before even falling asleep, but ever since the change, I'm out cold in minutes. I'm absolutely loving it. The mattresses are delivered right to your door, for free if you're in the US, and they come rolled up in a box so it's super easy to transport from outside to inside your home, and the setup is really easy, it took me about 10 minutes. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses including their award-winning Lux and Ultra Premium Elite collections, the Helix Plus, a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and the Helix Kids mattress, designed for growing bodies and endorsed by child sleep and medical experts. So if you are interested in a new bed, check out Helix Sleep. You can click on the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash sagesreign to get 20% off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. If you're nervous to buy something that you haven't tried yet, Helix Sleep has a 100 night sleep trial, so you get 3 months to make sure that you really love your mattress and that it's the right one for you. Plus, the mattresses have a 10 year warranty, and they even offer financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. So again, if you're interested, that's helixsleep.com slash sagesreign, or click the link in the description for 20% off your mattress plus two free pillows. This video will contain spoilers for the JJK manga. With this treasure, I summon. By all metrics, Megumi Fushiguro is a prodigy. Born with the inherited technique of the illustrious Zenin clan, the Ten Shadows, he has learned a domain and he is favored by the Satoru Gojo, as Maki once listed off. Satoru once pointed out to the sorcerer that their ancestors battled each other, a Gojo clan member with the six eyes and a limitless technique like him, against a Zenin clan member with the Ten Shadows technique, like Megumi. The two killed each other. Sukuna, the Dishonored One, takes great interest in Megumi and grants the sorcerer respect that he doesn't grant to many others. Even Sukuna has great expectations for Megumi and the power that he should have. So Megumi has the backing of both the strongest sorcerer of today and the strongest sorcerer of all time, and yet he can't reach the heights that he was supposedly destined for. Why? Megumi Fushiguro barely had a childhood. Upon meeting Gojo, the six-year-old Megumi tells him that he barely remembers what his father looks like and reveals to him that he and his sister Tsumiki have been abandoned by their parents, leaving the two orphans to raise themselves, sprinkled in with some help by the strongest sorcerer alive. Megumi is a nonchalant, calm kid. We don't know enough about him as a child to say that his personality had changed when his father had abandoned him, but we do know, however, from the light novel, that for Megumi, quote, numbness was the safety feature of his life. If he did not think of a way to protect his spirit, it would not be strange if a curse was born. Megumi has chosen to numb himself from all the negative emotions that he could have been feeling towards his situation. Whether it be regret, fear, or anger, Megumi has chosen apathy. Megumi has chosen repression. The calmness that we see from the Ten Shadows Inheritor is likely not the disposition that he was born with, but something he actively chooses to gain a semblance of control over his life. So many of Fushiguro's issues begin and end with the circumstances of his childhood. 
Unaware of Toji's troubles with his own past and his family, Megumi only knows that his father was absent throughout his childhood. Upon meeting him, Gojo informs the child that he was nothing but a trump card for his father, to be used and sold off to the Zenin clan. This abandonment by both his father and Sumiki's mother severely impact his sense of self. Though he never talks about it, it's rather evident. He mentions how the fact that his father, who cared so little about him that he gave him the name of a girl and then left him, is still allowed to run around in this world is proof that life is unfair. Abandoned and only sought after for his abilities, it only makes sense that Megumi does not value himself or his life, because from his perspective, his own father did not find value in him. From Megumi's perspective, Gojo didn't find value in him. They both only wanted his abilities, his potential. Nobody cared about Megumi, the person, the child. While Megumi is of course thankful for Gojo later on, he is still hyper aware that Gojo was not looking to parent Toji's children, but instead looking to bank on that trump card. Not to say that Gojo doesn't care for Megumi, because he does, but he cares more about the future of all sorcerers than about one kid's childhood. Megumi has had no control over his life. Orphaned by the first grade, Gojo presents him an offer to protect his sister by becoming a Jujutsu sorcerer. Tsumiki then falls into a coma, and so he goes to Jujutsu High to become strong enough to save her. He never wanted to be a sorcerer in the first place. Middle school Megumi explicitly states his dislike for sorcerers. He's gifted for sure, but he doesn't have the ambition or the selfishness that great sorcerers do. Not in the way that Yuji does, and definitely not in the way that Gojo or Sukuna do. Megumi views himself and Jujutsu sorcerers as cogs in the machine of karma and retribution. And he has been a cog ever since Gojo chose him. He is a cog and he can only judge himself through the lens of others. Megumi doesn't ever make decisions for himself, only making choices and thinking about what he does will impact the few people he cares about. He chooses who he saves and only good people deserve to be saved. And as a result of his abandonment, Megumi is unable to recognize now that people care for him, that people now want him to do better. They want him to consider his own life as something worth protecting. Gojo, Yuji, and Nobara all mention how closed off he is, how they know nothing about him, and Megumi has an extremely hard time making sense of this idea that people actually care about him. This combination of family-related trauma and manipulation creates the ultimate support guy, the guy who at any time is ready to summon the eight-armed general if it means others are safe. He simply does not care about his life because he's never been made to, really. Megumi as a sorcerer, as Gojo tells him, cannot even fathom the idea of being strong because he judges himself and compares himself to those around him, again ready to sacrifice himself at any moment because that at least ensures that he died making things better for those who deserve it. Despite the story of their ancestors, despite what history tells him, the possibility of one day even being stronger than Gojo for example, it's impossible. Immediately after Gojo mentions their history, he immediately shuts down any chance of that being possible. For me, it's hard to get angry at a character for not realizing their potential, when Megumi cannot even fathom that potential. He does not believe that exists. He is so wounded, so resigned to the choices he's made, to the person that he thinks he is, that this is not a possibility for him. He is a cog, nothing more, nothing less, and he acts like it. Megumi's upbringing, his numbness, this repression of so many different aspects of himself, doesn't only harm his potential as a sorcerer, it harms his own personal growth and the way that he navigates his relationships. Because the Ten Shadows inheritor and his sister were orphaned early on, the two were forced to grow up rather quickly. Megumi created his own set of morals and ideals based on the little that he knew of the world. Megumi has had no one to teach him to base his morality off of, to base his ideals off of. Megumi has molded himself to become the type of person who is logic-based and who doesn't take emotion into account, again due to the repression and the trauma. Fushiguro views the world quite simplistically, in black and white terms. There are good and there are bad people, a view of life that heavily values fairness and reason. Tsumiki took on this mother-like role in their relationship, whereas Megumi created a barrier, closing himself off even to his only family member. And in the flashback of chapter 59, you can see the friction in their relationship that has been built over the years. 
When Tsumiki disapproves of Megumi fighting, he responds by saying that she's not his mother, that she can't tell him what to do or who to be. And in her reaction to Megumi here, throwing the milk carton at him, she isn't the perfect person that Megumi often describes her as. Surrounded constantly by flowers, she isn't that perfect, pure, sleeping beauty. Megumi didn't know all that much about his sister, given his surprise at her connection to the Yasuhachi Bridge, though that whole interaction happened right behind him. But when he loses her, all of that changes. Perhaps a response due to the panic of potentially losing another person in his life, Megumi begins to deify Tsumiki. He can't even think about any negative traits that she might have had, the temper that she had. Instead, she becomes perfect in his mind. Tsumiki becomes his moral compass, his metric, his baseline. When Toto asks him what type of girls he's into, he immediately thinks of Tsumiki and her qualities. Somebody who is compassionate, he responds. Megumi found it unfair that a person as good as Tsumiki was cursed, and that there are people worse than her still walking. People like Tsumiki, people like Yuji, are good people. Those are people who deserve to be saved. That is Megumi's philosophy. Megumi's beliefs are fascinating because they give us insight into his lack of self-worth. The sorcerer deems himself as inherently undeserving of fairness. Why would he not consider himself to be amongst those who deserve fairness? Amongst those who deserve to be happy? This, what, 15-year-old kid who has done absolutely nothing in this world does not believe that he deserves the fairness that good people deserve. He does not believe that he is a good person. This shows us how absent his sense of self-worth really is. Megumi's reluctance to explore or even feel any of his emotions ends up creating one of Carl Jung's archetypes, the one he refers to as the shadow. In Dana Brooke Thurman's essay on the shadow, they define it as the often hidden, repressed part of ourselves that we choose to ignore, often because it contradicts with our personal values. It can be compared to the Freudian id since it represents humans' base needs and darkest desires. However, while we constantly acknowledge and battle with our id and superego, we often are not even aware of the shadow's existence. The more we repress it, the stronger and more dangerous it grows. Megumi, in his attempt to numb himself from any emotional harm in his personal life, has repressed his emotions, his desires, and even his own identity. Who is Megumi outside being a sorcerer? He represses this, perhaps to gain control in a life where he has none. Thurman writes that we have been conditioned by society to repress our inner selves and to only show the face that is deemed acceptable. Young believed that the tighter a lit a person keeps on his or her shadow, the more it fumes and stews inside, often creating neuroses and causing an array of psychological problems. Imagine a kettle on the stove with the spout corked. Society is the cork and the person's inner turmoil is the steam that is ready to explode. Obviously, the steam must be allowed to escape in a safe manner, as we must explore our shadow selves in order to become a whole individual. It's interesting because Megumi's shadow bears its face as he grows as a sorcerer. The first time he faces an opponent he deems as strong, he runs away, indicating his lack of self-belief. The next time he finds himself seemingly outmatched, he is alone, and Gojo's words dawn on him. As well as Sukuna's projection of strength, all help Megumi begin to believe in himself and push past his limits. This helps him create his own domain by being mentally selfish. But in these moments, Megumi's shadow begins to reveal itself, his latent darkness. Like a side of himself is freed when he's actively getting stronger in these moments. He puts on this massive smile, the uncontrollable laughing, his eyes wide, always juxtaposed with brutality, with violence. This is who Megumi pictures as the future version of himself and it is one that is so different than the restrained, always in control Megumi. One could argue that the emotion he numbed the most in his life was anger. Anger towards that lack of control in his life, anger that his father couldn't find value in him, anger that his sister got cursed. So when he finds that self-belief, that inner strength, when he gets extremely violent, when he begins to kill, it frees him in a way. And I can't mention his father without mentioning how much Megumi looks and behaves like Toji in these moments. Megumi not only emotionally locks himself out, but perhaps his potential has also been locked away in his shadow. When in that mode, Megumi changes. In the Cullen games, he kills when it's not needed. He even hunts down Remy, the relatively harmless girl 
and almost kills him if it wasn't for Tsumiki, his moral compass. These are the psychological problems caused by the lid on Megumi's shadow. However, Fushiguro throughout the story does advance towards the ceiling he's been told he must reach. His fight against Jiro, his discovery of Kirara's technique, taking down Reggie in the Culling Games. He's had no choice but to get stronger in order to save the people in his life. We do get hints of the valued treasure that Tsukuna has been waiting to see, the sorcerer that Gojo raised. At the same time though, Megumi doesn't move any closer to addressing or confronting his shadow. He embraces the anger within him, but he never examines why it's been hidden, why it's there in the first place. Megumi inches closer to his potential as a sorcerer, but as an individual, he doesn't change all too much. He does open up more to Yuji, even going out of his way to ask for his teammates help, but at the same time he becomes even more self-sacrificial when it comes to his friend. but it's most evident when he reunites with the now-awakened Tsumiki in the Cullen Games. And he reverts back to the same kid who's walled himself up to his sister, unable to tell her how he's been feeling the past few years. The one person he's been fighting for, and the best he can say to his sister, is that she can go back to sleep. The realization of his immaturity that he had, the apology, begging for her to wake up, and he can't tell his sister any of it. To compare his growth to Yuji's, Itadori repeatedly questions himself over the series. He grows, he processes his guilt with Higuruma, he admits it and he talks about it. Megumi never does, because that's who Megumi is. He pretends that he doesn't care, he represses it. When Gojo first met the kid, he refused to listen about his father because he'd already numbed himself to it all. Gojo even tells Megumi to one day ask him about it, and he never does. Because that's how Fushiguro has conditioned himself. After a bit of conversation with his sister, it's revealed that Sumiki has been taken over by a past sorcerer already. Fushiguro learns that the woman that he's fought hard for isn't his actual sister. And we see the always composed Megumi's heart absolutely shatter. And Sukuna capitalizes on this moment to take control of his prized possession. Megumi didn't know his sister enough to realize that it wasn't her, and he didn't heed Yuji's warnings about Sukuna. And so he finds himself a prisoner to the greatest sorcerer of all times. Megumi and Yuji as conduits for Sukuna are quite different. The Dishonored One calls Yuji a cage, while referring to Megumi as a vessel. Yuji's always had a powerful sense of self, matched by an even stronger resolve. His soul is so strong, so robust, so much so that he's able to resist the curse. Yuji knows precisely who he is, a once-in-a-thousand-year level talent, which is why he was able to resist the curse. Megumi, however, when you add in that his soul was plunged into darkness, you add in the fact that he already doesn't have a strong sense of self and self-worth. Though he was able to resist Sukuna, all of this makes it so much easier for Sukuna to take control of the young prodigy. All he needed was a little push. With Sukuna at the helm, we see Megumi's potential on full display. Nue becomes this gargantuan, titan-sized Shikigami. Sukuna has the eight-armed general Mahoraga under his control. And all of a sudden, the Dishonored One can turn the tides of any battle with the added bonus of his own abilities. But the final blow that Sukuna delivers to Megumi's resistance is killing Tsumiki, only using Megumi's abilities to further weaken and stain Megumi's soul with this guilt. After the death of his sister, Megumi has nothing to live for. Truly. His only reason for becoming a sorcerer, his only reason for lasting this long as a sorcerer, is now gone. To add insult to injury, against Gojo, Sukuna uses Megumi's soul to bear the burden of adapting to Gojo's ability. And it's with Megumi's body that Sukuna ultimately kills Gojo, the man who raised him. So his sister, his mentor, all destroyed with his body. Later on, Yuji is able to reach the withered Megumi and his soul, but Fushiguro's reaction tells it all. He's had enough. This world has taken and taken from him, and he has nothing left to give. He's not selfish like Sukuna or Gojo, and he doesn't have a heart of gold like Yuji. As he said time and again, Megumi is not a hero, but a cog who now failed in delivering karmic justice for the good people in this world. For his sister who did not deserve any of this. People harp about Megumi's usefulness, but he is the victim of the Jujutsu world. 
The burden of expectation did not bring him down. Instead, it was the burden of life, of having to continue living without a purpose. So can you blame him, really, given everything he's been through? So when we talk about Megumi and his potential, it's nothing more but expectations laid upon him. It's a concept, a ceiling that he was never going to reach anyway because he never had a reason to go out and reach it. He never had that desire to. From the day he was born, Megumi Fushiguro hardly had a chance or a choice. In my opinion, I think the only way Megumi makes his way out of these depths is alone, through his own resolve. Yuji couldn't do it, Gojo isn't there anymore, Tsumiki isn't there anymore. He has to do it alone. If Megumi is to emerge out of the shadow that has now consumed him and escape the Dishonored One, he needs to undergo the process which Young calls individuation. A process where one faces down their own shadow, they face down the unconscious, and they ultimately merge with it to finally be made into a truly whole self, into a whole individual. This only happens through a recognition and acceptance of one's shadow self. Megumi has never come close to self-realization because he has never acknowledged his unconscious self his darker side. He's never recognized and confronted all the emotion that he's buried deep inside of him, that he's numbed in order to survive. In addition to that, Megumi will have to cultivate a brand new motivation, not only for escaping Sukuna's entrapment as his cage, but Megumi needs to find a reason to live. Will it happen? I don't know. Jujutsu Kaisen is very much a tragedy, a look at the world and at people as inherently tragic beings. It's about systems and how people try to break through them and save their loved ones, but often fail in the process. A tragedy in the way that no sorcerer dies without regret. For a kid whose direction in life was violently altered in the first grade, Megumi did well. He tried hard, I think. I hope his character can make it through, because I don't think he deserves to suffer more. But I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't. Nor would I be surprised if Megumi gets engulfed by his own shadow, becoming someone entirely unrecognizable. Who knows what the future holds for Megumi Fushiguro?